We don't want all these centralized counterparties out there because we're so tired of like chasing you around and trying to regulate all the time. We want a decentralized ecosystem where we have that transparency, right? And we, and we know that it's neutral. It's not going to be controlled by some single shady actor, right? Hey, stop stealing my trading strategies. If you want to build your own trading strategies, predict, learn, and earn Bitcoin with zero risk, definitely have a look at our community app. It's tons of fun. We call this show Kryptonite. So uh, if DeFi was Superman, what would be the DeFi Kryptonite of today? Really like problems that you really want to solve like in the upcoming year or even few years, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's something that's <laughs> going to take many I mean, it's really going to be a, a decade long or many decades really long battle, right? And it's the, tr the true test of, um, of whether crypto is going to go mainstream or not, right? And that is integrating with regulation and integrating with uh, mainstream financial markets. Um, because, to, I mean, DAI and Maker today is, it, it's, right, I've seen a lot of growth, right? It's, it's great. It's really like paving the way for DeFi and there's, I mean, there's a whole DeFi ecosystem. There's so many startups, there's so many entrepreneurs, there's so many innovators all around the world that's building so many like just awesome applications, right? Um, but if you kind of like zoom out and look at it from a, from a broader perspective, um, it's still such a tiny, tiny ecosystem, right? I mean, it's a tiny market, right? Like even now with like DAI, um, the, the transition to multilateral DAI essentially being uh, you know, fully successful and We've almost reached the mark where there's a, there's 100 million, um, 100 million multilateral dying circulation. Um, I mean, that is actually nothing if you compare that to, let's say, a commercial bank, right? It's, it's not really the basis for any sort of like real financial system, right? Or you can't, you can't bank the unbanked with $100 million, right? You need a lot more, you need billions. And to get to that level of scale yeah. without, you know, just, inflating a bubble in Ethereum, uh, you know, or, or doing something similar to the, the financial crisis where we put all the eggs in one basket and just uh, counted on the real estate market to take care of everything, right? What we instead need to, to create a, a system that is scalable, but also, you know, secure and, and resilient and can last into the future, we need diversification of the assets in the system, right? So we need to go beyond just Ethereum. We need to go beyond just crypto even, right? We need to go into real world assets. And real world assets, um, I mean, that is the frontier of DeFi and of, of really blockchain in general. That is, yeah, I mean, it's going to be the biggest challenge yet, right? Because that's when we have to take all of our ideals, right? All of like our, you know, our fundamental goals such as, you know, unbiased, unstoppable, stable coin for everyone, right? And we have to actually go out and we have to explain to the regulators why the benefits of decentralization outweigh the, you know, what they perceive as the issues, such as it's, it's suddenly they can't control it all the way they normally do with the banks, right? Um, yet we still want them to support us, right? Because they need to, they need to help with the, the like the, the assets and the, like the, the liquidity that can allow something like DAI to scale to many billions, right? We need, you know, we need real estate, we need trade finance, we need commodities, we need, um, you know, um, stocks and, and just all these regular markets. And if we can get those tokenized, right, so we can do things like security tokens or, or, or asset backed tokens, we can get them onto the blockchain um, and, and start utilizing them in, in, first of all, in Maker, where it's really such, it's the most critical piece of Maker, right? Maker just truly needs diversification for it to really make sense at scale, right? Um, and then from there, as it's in Maker, and we've sort of done the ice breaking and we've actually started creating this ecosystem, this liquidity of security token and, and tokenized real world assets, then it can also start powering a many, you know, all of the financial innovation in the DeFi ecosystem, right? There'll be, they'll have both a, a very stable DAI that's backed by diversified assets, but they'll also have the ability to do things like, um, you know, automated market making for, um, I don't know, like commodity futures or something, right? Or, you know, insurance on, um, you know, the custody of gold or something like that, right? And once we get to that stage, 
which again, it's it's. Uh, I mean, we've obviously at Maker, we've been, we've understood that the challenge of regulation is like the the biggest priority of all, right? For in the like in the future now that the technology is here. Um, so we've always already been working on this for for several years, and we've had a lot of success, but. It's also only become apparent to us just how much we have to continue with this approach, right? And how the entire industry and the ecosystem has to come together and really, you know, present this unified front of blockchain is a good thing, right? It's going to actually benefit everyone. It's going to benefit the regular people. It's going to benefit the unbanked, the disenfranchised. It even has benefits for the regulators because for many regulators, their main concern is actually the exact same concern as those of us who are in crypto, right? Which is the you know the thread of uh, shady centralized actors right yeah. that, that sit behind the scenes and suddenly uh, turns out you couldn't trust them as much as you thought right? absolutely yeah like the fact that a, like and, and also something like the radical transparency of blockchain it's actually sometimes when when I go and like explain that to, to let's say um, like um, like financial or like securities regulators right and they they understand that this means I can do a real time audit. At all times, right? <laughs> that's like, that's exactly you. what they want. Yeah, that's what they want, right? I mean, I've heard some, actually, some bankers um, posit that it's actually not going to be, it's not going to be the banks, it's not going to be the financial system that's going to like truly like drive decentralization of finance at scale. It's going to be the regulators themselves because they'll be like, you know, we don't want all these uh, centralized counterparties out there because we're so tired of like chasing you around and trying to regulate all the time. We want the decentralized ecosystem where you know, we have that transparency, right? And we, and we know that it's neutral. It's not going to be controlled by some single shady actor, right? And, and when there are these centralized points of failure, which does always have to exist in the end, right? When it comes to things like custody of, of commodities, right? Or something, then um, when that's the case, the radical transparency just makes it so much easier to keep track of them, right? Which actually also like um, ties back to how Maker can, can approach this, right? Because um, a lot of people, they do get very, um, you know, I, I, I would even say scared, right? Of this idea that, well, DAI is, right now is this pure asset, right? It's backed by ETH, it's decentralized, you know, there's no governments that can seize it and so on, right? So once they start realizing that, okay, if we want to go to 100 billion, we can't rely on ETH alone anymore. So that means, that means centralized assets, that means centralization, that means now the government's gonna take control, right? But the answer is, that um, the, we can use the fundamental principle of decentralization, even in this new paradigm of tokenized real world assets in the form of diversification, right? So you don't want to put all, I mean, you never want to put all your eggs in one basket, right? So you never want to rely on just, you know, one custodian or even one legal system, of right? Course, yeah. You want to have real estate from every continent, right? You want to have trade finance assets from, uh, you know, as many different, um, jurisdictions that have a strong rule of law as possible in the whole world, right? You want to, we want to get Maker to a point where you could have, let's say, even the United States of America totally cracking down on it and saying, like, we're going to ban it, every, we're going to seize it all, we're going to ban it, you know? And if the, like, I mean, the, the ecosystem needs to be diversified enough and resilient enough that even if that happens, it'll keep going on. It'll, I mean, it'll be a big loss, right? But that's what MKR is for, right? That's that's one of the fundamental dynamics of the system is that it needs to be able to absorb these kind of events and keep going and continue to provide stability to the people that need it in Argentina and you know Venezuela and so on, right? And um, yeah, I mean, the path to, to that point is it's going to be a lot it's of work. It's going to be a lot right? of work, yeah. And uh, and ultimately, of course, we don't ever want to see. America cracking down on crypto, right? And I don't think it's going to happen because, I mean, um, with the right approach, it's just not going to happen, right? With, if you do education first and sort of like step-by-step -step adoption, um, everyone realizes the benefits, right? And, and it really can be done in a way where it just is going to be better for everyone. And in terms of, so you were talking about the crypto itself. So is that scalability of the blockchain one of the main problems that we need to, in order, because right now you said it talked about $100 million worth of DAI uh, on the side. So scalability was the main concern that you, you, you would like to see being progressed or solved. Is, is, that, is that one of the main things that? Yeah, so 
the I get asked this question a lot, right? Oh, yeah. and, and, we, and generally, that's one of like the top, you know, it's one of the top questions that we get in Maker alongside, you know, are you going to move to X Yeah, blockchain, Bitcoin, right? what are you going to Bitcoin? Or yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, we actually have a completely different perspective on this than most. So we don't really see scalability as like a, a real risk at all. Oh, interesting. Um, and that's because we, um, I mean, we're just focusing a lot on, on uh, cross-chain interoperability, right? So we really do see a future where uh, there's going to be many different blockchains. They're going to have many different trade-offs, right? Yeah. Some of them will be extremely centralized. Some of them will even be very regulated. Um, and what's important for us as a, as a decentralized project, right, is that we're able to be available on all of them. And um, yeah, I sometimes uh, call this concept uh, blockchain transcendence, right? Because the idea is really that it's actually possible to build a decentralized application like Maker in such a way that it doesn't really exist on just one blockchain, but that it really like, it's, it's like, a, it, you know, it sort of virtually exists on all of them, but it's a single system. Um, and um, ultimately there does need to be this concept of kind of like what I think of as the anchor blockchain, so kind of like the core where you, you know, which is the place where you have things like governance and, and uh, emergency response and like security um, uh, logic. Um, and that's where I think the sort of the, you know, the Ethereum 1.0 chain, that, that is a perfect blockchain for that because you do not need scalability for that. What you need is certainty, right, and, and resilience. And that's what Ethereum really brings to the table more than any other, um, you know, um, like smart contracts platform. And so from the Ethereum core, we then see a future where we will be branching out to all these different chains, right? And we already have many examples of this, right? So we already got um, XDAI. I don't know if you're aware of that, but that's no. like a... So XDAI is, uh, it's, I believe it's the first side chain to Ethereum. It's like, a, it's a very small, very high performance, but also quite centralized uh, side chain that has DAI as a native currency. And it allows users to like quickly move back and forth between the XDAI chain and the main Ethereum chain. So essentially, if you want to do microtransactions, you can just migrate, you can move your DAI quickly to the XDAI chain, do a ton of transactions, and then move them back to the Ethereum chain for like long-term safekeeping. Um, and XDAI has actually been, uh, it's been tremendously um, um, useful in, in, in some like very specific cases, uh, especially things like community currencies and like event specific currencies where you can get these like you know I, I, for instance at uh, some of the um, the e like ETH Denver is an example where like then there's this ETH Denver coin that's running on the XDAI chain and can be used to like purchase all sorts of stuff and it's it's incredibly cheap right um, and then uh, when all is said and done you can move so the bulk of your if you just want to do long term holding it's so easy to move it back to the Ethereum blockchain um, and there's we have another example of um, a cross chain link with uh, the EOS blockchain uh, for some Korean gaming application. So they use DAI as kind of like the, you know, as a native store of value, but they run all their, um, all their blockchain logic on EOS. And so they've built a bridge that allows them to also easily um, swap between, um, you know, like, like access liquidity that exists on the Ethereum blockchain, but then do all like their, their user interactions on the EOS blockchain. And both of these examples are right now still centralized examples of, of cross-chain um, uh, infrastructure. But what's coming next is actually decentralized bridges, right? And decentralized blockchain interconnection. Um, and we're tracking something like, I think, uh, seven projects right now that we consider oh, like, the, like very legit cross-chain projects. So ultimately, it's again this element, you know, this, this element of diversification that just means that there's going to be so many different ways to interoperate that... Um, you never have to worry about, you know, if the fees are too high where you're doing your transactions right now, it'll be so easy for you to move to a different uh, platform, right? And, and that also means you don't have to like commit to a single infrastructure. You can actually wait and see what becomes popular and you can even easily adapt over time, right? And um, finally, this approach is also what is needed for, for ETH 2.0 whenever that comes around, right? Because it's actually the exact same idea. It's just you just take Ethereum and you split it up into many, many more blockchains, right? And so it's really no different than just like the, the sort of the existing multi-blockchain um, universe, right? And um, on top of that, 
you know, the, and this is kind of like the standard answer that you get, right? It's like, you know, there's things, you know, there's all this new technology, zero knowledge proofs, optimistic rollups, all of this stuff that's also coming. Um, and I think with all of these developments combined, um, from our perspective, we, we actually don't really spend too much time thinking about um, scalability. We, like, we see it happening way in advance of, of what we need. So, um, yeah, I think, in my opinion, that's essentially a solved problem. And the real issue is not scalability of, you know, transaction bandwidth, is scalability of what I would call like economic bandwidth, right? Like the, um, of, of, of the ability to have a large financial ecosystem that is still able to maintain stability because it, it can rest on, on actually valuable assets, right? Because that's where we need to, you know, because the demand is always growing, right? Yeah. So that does mean that we do have to move fast in terms of getting the, the you know, the real estate in there, getting the, the gold, the, um, the commodities, the stocks, the things like trade finance, you know, lines of credit to small businesses, all of this, like, again, like the stuff that not only will like power the DeFi movement, right? And yeah. power the crypto company with, yeah. with actual diversified stability that isn't correlated to crypto itself. But also, you know, uh, benefit the other way around, right? By taking liquidity and taking capital from the, the crypto markets, right? And the, 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 you know, all the DeFi use cases and funnel that out into the real economy in the places where it's actually really useful, right? And where it really makes sense because it's to the, you know, the assets that, that actually matter, right? Um, I think potentially in a way that's going to be a lot more just, uh, you know, more efficient and more transparent. And uh, I would, I would uh, think potentially just with better risk management than the, than the current system. That is so interesting because that definition of scalability as in not worry too much about transaction per second, but worry more about the stability of the network, being able to hold all these assets to create an, uh, an economic or a new financial system. That's a really interesting way of looking at scalability. Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, that's certainly the really big challenge. And then there's also um, um, one other aspect that we think really needs, you know, that, that um, like it's a trend we're seeing in the wider ecosystem, and it's also a, a trend that, that we believe it's critical for Maker to uh, to be a part of, right? And that's the rollout of of um, you know synthetic assets, yeah. and just generally more options when it comes to stable coins, right? So right now we have Dai that's pegged to the U.S. dollar, and you know that's great if you're an American. It's great if you're from South America where they really love, you know, they really like the U.S. dollar. They're very familiar with it. Um, it's actually not so great if you're European, for instance, because you don't really, you know, you don't really deal with the US dollar in Europe so much, right? You've got the euro, right? So um, it's going to be, it would be impossible to convince a regular European business to start, um, you know, doing their payroll with DAI or, their, you know, do something like triple entry accounting or something where the internal treasury is, is uh, running with DAI. If that means now they have to take on the the, the forex risk of the U.S. dollar because they don't want that, they use euro, right? That's that's what's stable to them. So we of course also need a euro die, right? And um, we need to you know to to meet the demand of every other currency as well, right? Because fundamentally, the challenge of of uh, getting blockchain adopted in the real world is to reduce the friction of doing it, right? It's we want people to adopt blockchain without knowing that they're adopting it, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. no, no one went out there and tried to get people to adopt, you know, IP or something or, or yeah. you know, and, and you also don't adopt electricity, right? You adopt a lamp or something, yeah. like that, right? Yeah. And, and blockchain is the electricity, right? So in order to build these applications on top of blockchain that actually makes sense to regular people, um, you, the systems on the blockchain, including, including DAI, right, need to provide these fundamental services and these like fundamental um, infrastructure that people expect and at the very minimum what they've already got. Uh, very interesting. And th th you talked about synthetic assets. Uh, that's also a topic that's quite hot these days. Um, do you mind telling us what it is and, and are, is it just a hype or is it something that you believe has real value to it? If you don't mind sharing. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, I mean so from, from the perspective of Maker, there's, there's essentially like there's two aspects of synthetic assets, right? So the first perspective is that if you look at DAI, that's already a synthetic asset, right? So, so DAI true, is yeah. just a synthetic US dollar, that's right? That's true, yeah. And, and the, the immediate near-term next step is to just add more 
currencies, right? So euro, uh, British pounds, yen, renminbi, you know, and, and so on and so on, right? Because it's, it's actually incredibly easy and cheap to deploy, like to just like deploy more versions of the same system, right? Um, but it doesn't stop there. You can take it a step further and you can start doing yeah, what's I mean? What's more commonly, what 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 sort of in the in the in the broader sense and uh, and more commonly is referred to as synthetic assets, which is to take you know take existing speculative assets and create synthetic versions of them, right? So that would be things like synthetic gold, synthetic stocks, right? Synthetic um, commodities, um, but even things like you know a synthetic stock index, or I don't you know a synthetic token that tracks the GDP of Nigeria, you know, you can do all these like advanced uh, assets that ultimately are just re represented as a token, right? So it's extremely easy to access and understand if you already are using uh, digital assets, right? Um, but it can provide you, I mean, it can actually provide some really uh, amazing real world use, right? I mean, first of all, there's just, you can just imagine something like a decentralized trading platform, right? So it's it's like uh, it's like what we you know it's like a decentralized exchange today, but instead instead of just you know only being able to buy and sell Bitcoin or something like that, you can actually buy and sell anything, and uh, and and the assets that you're buying and selling are assets that ultimately have this very like ex, you know real um, backing beneath them, right? So you like so you're not just buying a synthetic asset and it's some paper thing where you don't know if it's you know the value is really there. It's backed by the entire maker ecosystem right so it really is as stable as like the die itself um, so it's both great for kind of like short-term speculation and, and trading on a trading platform but you can also use it for like long-term holding right um, which again uh, means that then you can finally provide some real value to the unbanked right finally they have access to this you know to what currently is is only available to essentially privileged people in the west right Finally, that entire suite of like financial products and services can be made available to everyone. And um, my really favorite example of how this can really play out in the real world and, and be something that that like you know truly like drives real value for, for real people and not and isn't just you know speculation and trading and all that stuff, right? Which uh, you know I mean many people will still see synthetic assets as being like yet another you know round of financial engineering, right? And what's the What's the real value, right? Like, how does it actually create something tangible? Um, and that's where I think you can go back to the the origin of, of derivatives, right? Like, why were they even invented in the first place? And that was, um, you know, crop yield futures, right? Which was essential to, um, for instance, uh, driving the, the agricultural expansion in the U.S., right? That was really able to, like, create a whole new level of, of financial stability for farmers, right? So they could they were able to expand their operations and not constantly worrying about, you know, the weather and yeah. uh, and, and just like um, the market, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, especially, you know, in the context of climate change, that just gets even more obvious how much this is needed, right? Because yeah. unfortunately, most of the people in the world, most of the farmers in the world, they still do not have access to this at all, right? They are actually completely in a, in a place where if um, they're unlucky with the weather, that's a big problem. Maybe they won't be able to eat you know if, yeah if, if sell their, their farm and really it can go yeah yeah so imagine if they can simply use a synthetic acid that is just like it's uh, it's essentially hedging their exposure to their crops right so it's like a, it's a, like they can sort of like you can think of it as like they're shorting their own their own crop essentially and what that means is that if um, if you know there's too much rain or, or whatever you know the weather ends up being really bad and their their um, you know the, the yield from their farming ends up being really bad, then the synthetic asset will then give them a great yield, right? And that way they they, they hedge their exposure just like the original derivatives from uh, many hundred years ago. Um, and that to me would be like, I mean, it's gonna take a long time, but that to me would be like just one of you know one of the ways we can really like prove that what we're doing has been successful in you know, providing real value to the real world, even when it comes to the very complicated, like the very advanced financial engineering, right? Because um, that's, again, that's what it's all about. Like in the end, this, none of this is for like, you know, speculation or whatever, right? Like that, that's not really what most people are into blockchain for and really what it's about. I mean, just isn't, right? 
what it's about is providing real value for real people, especially the people that right now just so desperately need it because they're they're being you know they're being biased against by the current system. It just doesn't work for them, and we have the power to build a new system that actually does right and actually treats them equally. And the value unlocked from equal treatment of everyone in the world by the financial system is going to be staggering. I mean, it's it's the it's the greatest um, example of just like totally untapped potential, right? The fact that there's, for instance, 1.7 billion people that don't even have basic banking services available to them, right? I mean, they're totally siloed off, right? Like the network effects that will occur once we bring all of these people online, so to speak, will, I mean, it'll, it'll eclipse anything else that's happening right now, I think. It's amazing because you covered almost every single aspect of DeFi in one interview. I was so happy. You're like derivatives, decentralized exchanges, stable coins, synthetic assets. You talk about lending. You talked about passive income, earning interest. Now, one thing that I really want to ask you um, before we end is in terms of passive income, a lot of people are saying that the entire financial system was built based on loans, like banks offering simple loans and being able to put your money into a bank account, a savings account, and get uh, interest uh, just by you know having your assets you know locked up somewhere. And a lot of people say that it's really weird because that's how it started, but you know, kind of lending in this whole passive income is coming a bit later here in, in this space. But is that the ultimate way to really get the attention of the mass before using derivatives or decentralized exchanges or, or lending and all that? Is that simple earn interest on your assets something that really excites you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is the call, right? It is, um, it is bringing the power of, of DeFi and Maker um, and sort of the funneling of capital to real world assets, right? And I think actually, if you look at the the history of, of like the short history of, of blockchain, it has played out very similar to the to the kind of the traditional financial system, right? Because you have Bitcoin as sort of the original analog to gold, right? Uh, and then you have DeFi as kind of like that's when it started transitioning into banking and and more more financial engineering. Uh, and and then finally, like the last step is then then you begin the real financial engineering of synthetic assets and all that stuff. That's fantastic. You shared so many gems today, like Rune. I've learned so much. And Thanks. I think there's no better person on this planet, it's my bias, to talk about DeFi and, and the future of DeFi. And for me now, it makes a lot of sense, you know, why this is important. Now, I already knew kind of why was it important, but now I can see more of a mid to long term picture of where we're supposed to go. So I really appreciate all the the great information. If we want to follow you, get in touch with you, what are the best uh, tools or what kind of social media is, is good to get in touch with you or the, the MakerDAO Foundation? Well, I mean, we're on, we're on Twitter, right? So we got, um, that's uh, Twitter slash MakerDAO. And I'm I'm also on Twitter. I don't use it that much, but I'm, I'm Rune K -E -K, uh, on Twitter. And then, um, you, I mean, one of the places where people go if they really want to participate more deeply in Maker and be a part of like, you know, of really like shaping the future of DeFi because Maker at its core, the point is to have, I mean, a decentralized platform, but crucially also decentralized governance of that platform, right? So we've spent a lot of energy on building this open ecosystem where it actually is everyone is a, is a part of building it, right? And everyone participates. Um, and so for that we have the forum, so that's forum.makerdao.com. Okay. Yeah, and uh, and we've also got a chat room that's a little bit more for kind of like a casual, free-flowing conversation, right? So that's chat.makerdao.com. And uh, currently, I mean, we still have the foundation, right? So so that's what I work for, right? And the foundation is it's similar. The Maker Foundation is similar to something like the Ethereum Foundation in the sense that it's kind of like it's building the basics of the system, right? We launched multilateral DAI, and now our next step is to really roll out the decentralized governance. And then eventually, um, the goal is really that the foundation will disappear entirely from the picture because wow. the community will ultimately have all the tools that's necessary and all the education and knowledge necessary to run the entire system itself. And it simply will not, there will be no use for a foundation at that point. It'll, the protocol and the community will have everything it needs to be a, you know, a true DAO, right? A truly uh, autonomous organization. 
That's fantastic. That would be a complete like paradigm shift, right? Having completely decentralized and not needing a foundation anymore where it just works by itself like this self-sufficient market. That's really incredible. I really hope we get there soon. I mean, the DAO is something that we also really preach a lot and, and explain that it might actually be more important than Bitcoin at times because rather than creating just a bank account or a store of value, it's creating an entire economy or ecosystem that can really benefit everybody. So I, I really hope you guys get there very soon. Again, if you come to London and want to come back on Crypto Nights, yeah, it, literally you're our guest any, any time. Thank you so much, Rune, for coming on. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And guys, for those watching out there, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment here below. We'll try to get back to you and answer as soon as possible. We're here with E8 Partners, and we have the wonderful Rune Christensen. We look forward to seeing you again next week, premiering at 8 o'clock GMT at a PC near you. Thanks for watching, guys.